Um, a few words of introduction. Uh, Lauren Groff studied at Amherst College in the United States and at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She now lives in Florida and is the author of two previous novels prior to the one we'll be discussing today, uh, The Monsters of Templeton and Arcadia, as well as a short story collection, Delicate Edible Birds. She's won a number of awards for her fiction, including the Penn O. Henry Award and the Pushcart Prize, and most recently has published Fates and Furies, uh, which we're going to be discussing this afternoon, which was a New York Times bestseller um, and was named as Amazon's Book of the Year last year, and then at the end of the year received what is perhaps the ultimate accolade as being named as President Obama's favorite book of the year. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful book. It's an intricate, beautifully plotted, and ultimately deeply moving account of a marriage, and I'm very, very proud to be discussing it with Lauren this afternoon. Please welcome Lauren Groff. Thank you. Before we get started, can I just say thank you so much for being here. It's a beautiful day. You could be doing anything else, so it's, it's really wonderful that you're not. Thank you. Look, I, I thought we would start with this, you know, you get this endorsement from the leader of the free world. <laughs> right. um, you know, <laughs> Just where were you when you heard this? And what effect, if any, has this had on, on your work and on, yeah. on the book? So I was actually um, home procrastinating. Uh, I'm, I'm writing two other things right now. And I was on Twitter, which is what one does when one procrastinates. And uh, someone tweeted it at me, and I didn't believe them. And then I went online on People Magazine, which is where it was published, and I passed out. Then I called my husband. Um, made him come home with champagne. Uh, and then I forgot about working for the rest of the week because then I got a lot of interviews. Um, so, so the thing about that was that was so wonderful. There were multiple things that were really, really wonderful yeah. about it. One was Obama actually sent me a handwritten letter, which it was silly. I mean, I wept. And, you know, this is someone I, I worked really hard to get into the Oval Office. Um, I, I live in Florida. It's a very conservative state. I knocked on every single door, basically, in the town where I lived. Um, but the, uh, oh, thank you. Um, but the other thing that happened was, for some reason, as soon as this, this endorsement happened, men felt like they could read my book. Uh, um, right. right? Uh, right. Which, you know, I don't write only for women. I write, you know, I would like to write for everyone. Um, and, and I, for a long time, women are the ones in the U.S. at least who read books. I mean, and they have book clubs and it's I, as much about the book as it's about the wine, which I completely understand. Um, but uh, for a long time, I had a really hard time getting the male, uh, yeah, you yeah. know, readership. And then suddenly, men are reading me, and I feel so happy because this book is, you know, it's it's both. It's for it's there's a male protagonist and a female protagonist. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. It's fantastic. I mean, you know, the way that I mean, he, is it Labor Day or one of the national holidays? He goes to the bookshop in Washington with his daughters and buys yes. a pile of books. He does it three or four times a year. Yeah, yes, yeah. 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 It's, it, no, he's a he's an immensely good reader, and in the private letter that he wrote me. He said that um, he likes to go to these very intense conferences about world affairs, and then on Air Force One, he'll read a novel on the way back to sort of relax. Um, which, you know, better than watching a movie, yeah. right? Good for him. It's, can we talk about, a bit about the structure of the book for starters? Mm -hmm. It's about a marriage, story of a marriage, and it's in two pretty much pretty equal halves pretty much mm -hmm. equal halves. Um, the first half is from the husband, Lotto's point of view, the second half from Mathilde's point of view, his mm -hmm. wife. How did you come up with that to start with? So this book started in the middle of uh, when I was writing my last book, which is Arcadia. And Arcadia is all about um, uh, basically what we're doing to the planet. It's, it's uh, very much about you know the moral problems with yes. bringing children into the world. Um, and it was, it was, writing that book was akin to taking out my own heart every morning and taking a bite out of it. It was very painful. It was a very painful book to write. Um, it, it felt necessary, but I wanted to do something at the same time, and I usually write multiple books at once, um, and we can talk about that later. I know it's crazy. Um, but I wanted to do something that uh, was fun, right, because it was so hard to write Arcadia. So what I did was I, um, 
I was responding to a couple of previous uh, books about marriage, Mr. Bridge and Mrs. Bridge by Evan S. Connell. These are just masterpieces, absolutely amazing books. And um, Jane Gardam, who's this extraordinary British writer, um, wrote the Old Filth novels. There are four novels in the Old Filth um, set. And it's about a marriage, basically. Um, so I, I, from the beginning, I knew that I wanted to do two books. No, I thought I was doing two actual separate oh, novels. Okay. Okay. Um, and what I did was I put on the walls of my studio huge, huge pieces of butcher paper. Um, and then I would write Lotto's point of view and then turn around and immediately write Mathilde's. And then as I was writing Arcadia, if I'd come up against something that I couldn't quite get through, I would get up and just do that back and forth. Um, yeah. So that was my first draft on these enormous pieces of paper on the walls. Yeah, yeah. Is, I mean, one of the, for me, one of the great pleasures of the, is the, this, I mean, I'm interested to hear about this big blocks of paper. Because yeah. It is, the, it's intricately plotted, as I say, but it's, it's a pleasure to follow these intertwined sort of stories and, and narratives and they double back on each other as, as we go along and so on. But it must have been a depth, I mean, it's like a fantastically complex soap opera. I think, <laughs> right. you know, in the best way, in the best way, in the best way, I promise you, I promise you. But can you just talk a bit about that? I mean, just the, yeah. the logistics of that. So, uh, yeah, my, my, the way that I write is odd um, and it, it ends up working out for me uh, and it took a very long time to figure out how to do it. But what I do is I do layers, um, which means that I will sit down, I'll give myself four to six months to write a first draft. Um, and I do it really fast. I do it in longhand because it's very, very important that the paper be closer to the face. You're not doing this with the laptop, you're doing this, right? Okay. But also paper has pores in it. It's like human skin in a lot of ways. It feels almost as if you're interacting with something slightly more sentient than yeah, a, yeah. You know, a laptop. Uh, so I do this all in longhand, throw it out. And then I start over again. And I do this over and over and over again until I feel as if the foundational issues, the plot issues, the character development, uh, it's, it's sort of taken care of. And then I can write the novel sentence by sentence because the sentences are why I got into writing. I mean, I love writing. I'm an absolutely failed poet. Um, and <laughs> if I could be a poet, I would be a poet. But no. Whoa. That's God saying, yes, you should not be a poet. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're right, um, and so and so you know I'm 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 deeply invested in um, making sure all of the foundational stuff is done is just done. So actually, when it came to this book, I'd probably done 13 drafts where I threw it out and started over again. And on the 14th draft, I knew the story. I mean, it was almost yeah. as if I had built. It's I, I like to liken it to a 3D printer. Yeah. Where you're doing layer after layer after layer, and then you build sort of a structure that you can walk through. Yeah. You can choose your way through the structure and come out the other end with a book. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. It reminds me of something. I have a theatre background, as, as, as yeah. you know, and it reminds me of an, an account I read of, of Samuel Beckett yeah. directing oh, one of his own plays. Yeah. And, you know, the, the writing was very precise, you know, how many full stops, I mean, you know, da 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 da, how, how long to pause and so on. And one of his leading actresses, Billy Whitelaw, who performed the premieres of his plays, was asked, you must find this very restricting. But she said, oh, no, 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 you know, because within the structure, you can do whatever you want. Yes. Uh, but, yes. The, but it's important to have the structure, it seems to me. Well, I, my oldest child is named Beckett for a reason. Um, I love Samuel Beckett. I, he's just, he, I, I adore the man. I find so much humor in him that a lot of people, I think, don't find. But also, I, this is also my poetry background, where... Uh, in poetry, there's a lot of form. Even if even if you're creating your own form and you're not doing a villanelle, right? Say or a kazal, you know, that you're still writing to a yeah. particular form. And what happens when you write to a form is that uh, it opens up a billion choices, not infinite choices, right? Yeah. The problem with writing without form is that you have too many choices almost, yeah. and, and you can go in any direction. But having almost a frame around what you can do is sometimes really important yeah. for finding um, new ways to do things. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I agree. And it's like, you know, it, it's good to have rules, even if so you know you're breaking them. If you say Absolutely. Them, it's good they're there. Right. Right. To, the consciousness is important. And in fact, um, it's really important to know that you're breaking them. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. One of the things, it seemed to me, I, I welcome your opinion, it seemed to me that the book is... How can I, it's not so much about a marriage as about how to view a marriage, it seems to me. But please correct me on that. If you, yeah. 
Yeah, so I said this earlier, I'm sorry if you heard this on the radio, but um, my publicist in the United States, when she was trying to figure out how to talk about this book, because it's really, really hard to talk about, um, she said, you know, the way that I see it is, um, this book is kind of about a marriage the way that a bomb casing is about a bomb. You know, it's not really. It's what contains the sort of explosive yes. material yes. on the inside. Yes. And so I've been quoting her from then on. Yeah. Um, because I like that, right? Because this book is actually, the, the marriage is the way to look at other things also, yeah. right? It's, it's a way of looking at sort of what we take for granted. Um, yeah. But it's... Also, it, it talks about privilege, it talks about art, it talks about who gets to create art, yes. you know? It talks about um, the creation of narratives within relationships okay. and without relationships too, because marriage is inherently both extraordinarily intimate, but it's also extraordinarily performative at the same time too. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, to work with all of these items and I wanted very badly to work with um, the idea of uh, female rage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask you because I was going to ask you about this because you're talking about the performative aspects of marriage, and yeah. I did wonder whether is 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 Lotto's point of view the point of view? Does it is it the same as the point of view of the outsiders observing the marriage? Often, yeah. But, but what I like about well, you know, Lotto is a is a distinct character. He's incredibly narcissistic. Oh, gotcha. I mean, that's his defining yeah. characteristic. Yeah. I mean, he's very charming. He's sort of like I like to think of him as almost you know Bill Clinton. Um, you know, it's kind of you know everybody kind of falls a little bit in love and you're, you're swoon a little bit, and then when he walks out of the room, he said, "What what just happened? I don't even know." You know, so um, so yes, uh, so his view his marriage is everyone else's view but he also has this secret darkness to yeah. him and so it's it's not the it, it sort of it plays with everybody else's idea he takes their ideas of what his marriage is into him but he also knows that it's separate and it's uh, intimate and it's unique to him yeah, and, yeah. And I mean I think also his attitude to pre before marriage his attitude to sex his rather indiscriminate attitude oh, absolutely. Is, is really narcissistic it seems to me it, it, it just doesn't matter whoever it is you know to, well yes and no, um, he he loves people for who they are, their best parts of yeah. them, right? And yeah. he loves their physical characteristics that are beautiful. And he yeah. and he kind of, yes, he's narcissistic, but he also falls in love with say. He, there's this point where he falls in love with this woman's ear, uh, the sort of the lobe of her ear, because it's just it looks like a cherry. Yeah. Um, and he just wants to like touch the cherry. Yeah. Uh, so he's the sort of person who's both narcissistic, but also can only see good in other people. Yes. Um, but maybe that that ability to see good in other people comes out of the narcissism. The, yes. the, there's almost an intellectual inability to um, to imagine uh, inside someone else, perhaps. Yeah. 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 They're both <laughs> they're both very tall. Yes, it's, it's, it's actually it's fascinating. But you know, they're, 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 speaking as somebody who is not tall, um, it's fascinating because they're, it, it privileges them in yeah. some ways. It seems to me. Yeah. Can yeah. you just talk a bit about that? I mean, they've, he's six three, I think. Six, if I remember six. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Six six. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Can you talk a bit about that decision and that, that this sort of it makes them into this sort of gilded couple? So well, that came directly out of my own dear husband, who is six six. Um, and I see the way that he walks through the world, and there is inherent privilege in height. Yeah. There is. You know, they, they make, I think, seven, some, some, some obscene amount of money more than people who have the same brains, you know, who right. are the smaller, yes. And actually, um, the tallest presidential candidates are the ones who are always elected in the United States. I don't know why. It's very strange. It's happened like this for 200 years. Um, so it's, there is an inherent privilege, and, and a lot of this book is about inherent privilege and yes. questioning inherent privilege, too, yes. because there is privilege in being born tall. There's privilege in being born beautiful. There's yes. privilege in being born wealthy to a wealthy family um, and, and to being born white and male. All of these things are things that Lotto has, and he doesn't see them as anything but his due. Yes. And that's a problem, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. one of the deepest problems of this book. Yeah, yeah, because, and it, just, it, it leaves trouble in his wake. It yes, casts, yes. Uh, innocently. Innocent, it's completely, right. Completely, yes. completely, yes. completely. To what extent, I mean, this is a tiny spoiler, but I think, I hope it's forgivable, but. I don't know. To what extent, <laughs> do they remain this sort of gilded couple? Through, through their 
marriage. To what extent is this because they don't have children? Yes. So the focus doesn't shift. I wonder if the focus doesn't shift to the children, as it were, yes. would be the case more often with a couple. Um, yes. Uh, as a person who has two children, uh, it, it changes your marriage almost indescribably. Yeah. Uh, and you know this also, right? You have children. No, you don't know this. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought you said that earlier. I'm not sorry that you don't have children because I think that it's, uh, you know, it's I'm glad I don't have children. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, so I wanted very badly just to see what happens in a marriage without children. And, and you know, in a certain point, and I don't think that this is a spoiler either, one of the characters desperately wants one. Um, the other character is very cold and sees what would happen if that happened. Um, and there are potential bad things that would happen that, she, that I guess she would never let uh, happen in, in the, the world of the story. Yeah. So, you know, it's... Um, for a lot of people that I know, it was just an automatic thing that happens after you get married, you have kids. Yeah. Um, for me, it was a desperate, almost moral struggle to, to come to terms with the idea of having children. Yeah. And I wanted very badly to think about what would happen if you'd make the choice that I didn't make, um, which is just to remain childless, or not child-free. Yeah. I think is the preferred terminology. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. It is fascinating to see. To see, I have obviously have friends with children, and the extent to which, if you'll forgive the generalisation, but the extent to which they, they do shift to living their lives vicariously through the children. You know, yeah. it's the children's you experience. Mean we? The, the parents. Yes. Do. Yeah. 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 It's, no, it's, yeah. Which I, as a selfish person, I would find difficult, if, you, if that mm, makes sense. You know, mm -hmm, it's quite, mm, quite, tough, yes. quite tough. But again, with Lotto and Matilde, you know, the focus remains on each other. Absolutely, you know, right, uh, right. And it has to, because yeah, if one yeah. other person were introduced into this marriage of this colossal narcissist yeah. and his wife, who is not, um, in, in very deep ways that I don't want to give away because she's... That would be a spoiler. You know, if a, another person were introduced here, um, it would be almost like Pandora opening the box. It would be chaos. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I resist a lot of the parenting culture that happens to the bourgeoisie. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I call myself one of those people. Um, and it happens... It overtakes you almost from behind. It's this tsunami that just sort of brings you down and you don't quite know what's happening. Um, but it's not my experience. My experience is Lotto's experience in a certain way. I have clung to my space um, in possibly ways that make my husband deeply uncomfortable, right? Uh, he's now, he's been home with the boys alone for two weeks. Yay. Um, you know, the moment my oldest son was born, I had a babysitter for yeah. him. Um, and I would come out to feed him, obviously, and then go back in because at that point they're connected to your body and you can't get away from them. Um, but, but I always take, took that space because I hate uh, the stereotypes that we fall into as parents. I hate... Um, the idea that you, you can't create your own uh, ability to deal with your own children. Yeah. Um, and my children are happy, right? And they're cared for and they're loved. It's just not in the, sa the, the normal way that one sees children being cared for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When well, yeah. you say uh, you, you need your own space, is that like in, in your case as a, as a creative? I mean, we're all creative in our yeah, own way. Right. But as a working artist, is that to do with preserving your creative space. Absolutely. And even when I, there have been years with my kids when they were young uh, that I have not written a single keepable word, right? Uh, but I'm paying this person $15 an hour to watch my kids and it feels, you know, I, 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 re I refuse guilt uh, because guilt is something other people put on you. Yeah. Um, but it feels bad to be throwing money at nothing. You know what I mean? But I have to have that space yeah. because if you do not have that space, nothing can happen for your work. Um, and I think most of writing fiction, at least, is just having the dream space. You know, it's not necessarily having the page, which you have to be welcoming to. It's, it's, it's being able to sit by yourself in a room 
close your eyes and dream yeah. uh, for hours at a time. And sometimes that dreaming is lucid dreaming. That's what I think reading a book is, is actually lucid dreaming, being guided by someone else into these other worlds. But you know, as I said this again, sorry, I'm repeating myself for those of you who um, were listening to the radio, but you know, reading, the, the, the fact of reading a book is that um, the writer only does some of the work, but the reader does most of the work, right? Yeah. The writer writer creates the template, the reader finishes the book yeah. in her brain. Yeah. Um, and that's a very, very beautiful idea, right? Yeah. You're, you're sending out little tendrils of your, your own mind to other people, but they only become actual plants in the other person's brain. Um, yeah. And I think that that's, um, it's necessary to remember as both a reader and a, a passionate, uh, you know, a writer and a passionate reader. Do you have, I mean, I'm not sure do you have, whether you have this perspective on this, do you think your writing has changed since you became a mother? Is that possible yes. to tell? Yeah, it has, yeah. Um, I think in the past I was more willing to look at history. Uh, this is something that I was I was really interested in, and it's not that I'm not interested anymore, but it almost feels as if the urgencies of the current moment are so intense because I'm looking into the future through my kids' eyes, right? Yeah, yeah, and the sure. future is a very frightening place, so that the current moment is where I want to write out of now, yeah. um, as opposed to writing out of the past. Now I know that the past really good fiction that is set in the past actually talks about our current moment. I mean, that's what makes it good sure, sure. historical fiction. Sure. But um, I'm, I'm worried about sort of the shadowy uh, future. I mean, that's, that's the most urgent thing sure. to us right now. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, lots to ask you, but I wanted, I think it'd be good if you could read a little, would you mind? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I'll read from the, sorry. I'll read from the beginning. Okay. Um, there's sex here. As, you know, do, do earmuffs if there are children. Okay. This is at the very, very beginning of the book, so there are no spoilers. A thick drizzle from the sky, like a curtain sudden sweeping. The seabirds stopped their tuning, the ocean went mute. House lights over the water dimmed to gray. Two people were coming up the beach. She was fair and sharp in a green bikini, though it was May in Maine and cold. He was tall, vivid. A light flickered in him that caught the eye and held it. Their names were Lotto and Matilde. For a minute, they watched a tide pool full of spiny creatures that sent up curls of sand and vanishing. Then he took her face in his hands, kissed her pale lips. He could die right now of happiness. In a vision, he saw the sea rising up to suck them in, tonguing off their flesh and rolling their bones over its coral molars in the deep. If she was beside him, he thought, he would float out singing. Well, he was young, 22, and they'd been married that morning in secret. Extravagance under the circumstances could be forgiven. Her fingers down the back of his trunks seared his skin. She pushed him backward, walking him up a dune covered in beech pea stalks, down again to where the wall of sand blocked the wind, where they felt warmer. Under the bikini top, her goose flesh had taken on a lunar blue, and her nipples in the cold turned inward. On their knees now, that the sand was rough and hurt. It didn't matter. They were reduced to mouths and hands. He swept her legs to his hips, pressed her down, blanketed her with his heat until she stopped shivering, made a dune of his back. Her raw knees were raised to the sky. He longed for something wordless and potent. What? To wear her. He imagined living in her warmth forever. People in his life had fallen away from him one by one like dominoes. Every movement pinned her further so she could not abandon him. He imagined a lifetime of screwing on the beach until they were one of those ancient pears speed walking in the morning, skin like lacquered walnut meat. Even old, he would waltz her into the dunes and have his way with her sexy, frail bird bones, the plastic hips, the bionic knee. Drone lifeguards looming up in the sky, flashing their lights, booming fornicators, fornicators to rouse them guiltily out. This for eternity. He closed his eyes and wished. 
her eyelashes on his cheek, her thighs on his waist, the first consummation of this terrifying thing they'd done, marriage meant forever. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you do write very good sex in this. Oh, thank you. No, 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 I mean it, I mean it. There's a lot of it, which is great. And, so much. And, but it's, you, it's not easy. It's not easy to write sex, I don't think. No, and it's true. You do write it fantastically well, and I think it's partly because... I don't know, I think you contextualise it in some way, in, emotionally, in where the, where, the, where the characters are at that point, I think. Um, but I wondered, to what, extent are the, to what extent are the sex scenes, are they about the person who is in control or has the power at that moment in time? Yes. So I see uh, sex as just a physical manifestation of dialogue, yeah. right? And yeah. dialogue, as you know, you know better than I do because you have a background in theater, dialogue is about power, yeah. right? It's yeah. about um, the transfer of power from one person to the other, and it's about sort of tracing the invisible way that power ex is in any kind of relationship, even if you just meet this a person, you know, if you're buying a coffee from someone. Yeah. There's, a, there's a relationship of power in that purchase. Yes. Um, so sex is a conversation. It's a physical yes. conversation. It's, it's, and it has to reflect the emotions of the people who are within the scene that yes. are happening at the moment. Uh, and it's a transfer of power, yes. right? It very much is. So th that's the way that I see it. And yeah. I think that, that a lot of times people f come into trouble when they write about sex, when they just write about the physical, yes. and they don't write about sort of what's happening underneath the surface, the emotional aspects of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely right. You, you, you do do it fantastically well, because it's not about the sex. No, it's, it's not about, about the sex, It's yes. about the thought yeah. and the emotion that goes into, into the sex. And it's interesting because sometimes when one does read less good descriptions of this, the reason it stands out, I think, is because the rest of a novel is about thoughts and experience right, and emotion, right. and yet suddenly when you get the sex bits, they're not. No, no. Do you know what I mean? Right, right, right. You're, 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 it's seamless. If you see what I mean, it thank fits, you. if that makes, if that oh, makes well, sense. Thank you. You know, it's, it's, I mean, it's a challenge, right? Because no matter what you do, someone will hate the sex scenes. Sure. Um, but in the end, I mean, I'm old enough and I've had four books now. This is my fourth book. And I just thought, why am I afraid? Why am yeah. I afraid to write about sex? I mean, it's such an important part of our lives. Most yeah. of our lives, not everybody, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I absolutely appreciate that choice too. But it's how, up until now, we've made babies. You know, I mean, that's how we ourselves have been put onto this planet. And, you yeah. know, it's, 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 um, it says so much about uh, the, the power inherent in, in the world that we live in, yeah. right? The sex. And so I think the, the fact that literary writers in particular ignoring the, yes. the fact yeah. of sex is ignoring a huge, huge part yeah. of the human universe. Um, you know, I, I know it's not, it's not necessary to every book, but I think it's necessary to many books that's, that it's absent from. Yeah, 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 I agree. And it's, it's also something, it's also almost a sort of a taboo side because it's, mm -hmm. it's not always about the making of the baby. Sometimes it's just about right. the pleasure of the sex. Of course, you know? most of the time it's not about the babies. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah, in fact, yeah. the babies are sometimes a surprise. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shock. Um, yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's about pleasure. It's about so many things, right? Yeah. And, and that's, what, that's what makes it really, really hard to write about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. We mentioned theatre, and yes. the, the theatre runs through the novel uh, oh. in different ways. I mean, no spoiler to say Lotto is a successful, he becomes a successful playwright mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, later in, 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 the, in the marriage. Um, but there, was, there were wonderful, you use theatre fantastically well just in the structure of the novel as well. I'm thinking, for example, you have a sides in a, in a classic Shakespearean right, way. Right. Characters are talking and they right. just talk out, as it were, to camera. As it were, can you talk a bit about that? That must have been great fun. It's, but it works really beautifully Thank in just you. revealing something about uh, makes us complicit. So, so the idea of this uh, sides actually came out of uh, so many different elements at once that I can't actually tell you where the original yeah. seed was. Um, but one was yes, I started thinking really deeply about plays. You know, I think uh, because my character is a playwright and he had to read every play, and I had to read all the biographies of playwrights and get really offended by the fact that the wife of the playwright is always this shadowy creature who never really comes onto the page. Um, and and so you know, I started thinking about you know what 
how how to have this sort of voice, the God voice, come down and sort of stab the book and then come back out again. Um, but also, this 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 aside. Um, comes out of my absolute adoration of Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. Oh, right. Okay. Um, it, but it's a, it's, I use it in a different way, I yeah, think. Yeah. Um, you know that, so for those of you who haven't read To the Lighthouse in a while, there's that center section called Time Passes. And in Time Passes, it's this glorious, extraordinary moment where in the first part of the book, we sort of get a stream of consciousness in all sorts of characters' heads, uh, the circling about the sun in the solar system, who is Mrs. Ramsey, the mother of the, the kids, you know, the wife of the, the, the sort of philosopher, I think he is. Um, and she's just this beautiful person who keeps everyone in her orbit. I mean, she, that's, that's what the first part of the book is. And the second part of the book, Time Passes, is very short. But instead of human time, we're not dealing with human time in the, in the second part. We're dealing with a more cosmic time. It's a, it's a time as imposed upon this decrepit house that the family in the first part of the book was living in is sort of falling apart. And you get to see wind coming in through the windows and slowly peeling the wallpaper down. And you see shawls sort of nibbled at by the rats. And you know you start to see this cosmic time. And then and the human slowly seeps out of the house as people don't live there anymore. And the time comes in. What happens then is that as time passes, there are these bracketed sections, these almost asides from the human world that sort of enter into the house. And they give you news about the characters in the first part of the book. And my favorite, favorite death scene on the planet is Mrs. Ramsey's death scene. It's the most horrible, horrifying thing because it's so simple. It's, you know, we have these beautiful images of, you know, the leaves and everything. It's just elemental time. And then in brackets, it's um, Mr. Ramsey coming into the hall, reaches his arms out for Mrs. Ramsey, but she, having died in the night, is not there. You know, and it's like, oh my God, she's gone from the book. Um, and it's so devastating because of this um, almost layer of different kinds of time, this, the, the, the deep elemental unhuman time, and then the human time sort of piercing down into it. And what I wanted to do was actually flip that. So I yes. wanted to have the, the human sort of granular time throughout the book, and then the elemental, you know, severely objective voice sort of poking down, poking holes into, mm. into the granular. Mm. There's a fantastic sequence, a very, very short paragraph, it's just a paragraph really, which I absolutely love, which is um, uh, they're having a party in the, uh, they have a, a lot of parties yeah. uh, when they move to New York, and, yeah. and it's in a basement apartment. And a man walks past, it's Christmas time, I think, if I remember mm. rightly, and a man walks past and he just looks in the window. So you, you switch the point of view so beautifully, it just flips <laughs> from the party outside. And he looks down at this and he just takes, this, takes in this image of people, these revelers. And then he walks on, but the image stays with him for the rest of his life. Mm. And you sort of do this sort of, for want of a better description, it's like a fast forward. You just yeah. fast forward his life <laughs> yeah, in, in a paragraph, but it's just exquisite. Thank it's you. absolutely brilliant. But again, it, to me, it performs, again, a similar function to an aside mm. in that you're, you're contextualizing, because often in Shakespeare's time, the, the aside was, it's a commentary out to the audience, mm. you know, about so-and-so right. here, right. and you're just broadening it out and giving the, the audience, on the one hand, complicit, but on the other hand, sort of distanced mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. I think. But yeah. that's a great example. That, that short sequence is wonderful. Well, it's an, it's an amazing thing because it is, it's, it's an invitation to the reader um, or the audience to come into the text in a different way, yeah. right? To yeah. be complicit yeah. with the text. And I find that, I always find that really, really fascinating, yeah. right? As, uh, the changing up the landscape up for the reader yeah. to a different way, to, to provide them a different way to come into the text, too. The other thing, just on an incredibly practical craft level, because I know there are probably some writers in, in the audience, is that it was a way to tie together what I had thought were two separate books. Right? Yeah. And they're written in extremely yeah. different um, ways. I mean, uh, Lotto's is relying on a lot of narrative tropes that we've seen before. You know, that he, his section is reliance on romantic, chivalric, 
you yes. know, courtly romances, but also plays, but also, you know, basically uh, the buildings room and the consular room. And I mean, he, 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 everything is in his part of the, the, the narrative because he has built his life about around narrative, right? That is what he knows. Mathilde's section is much more, um, it's almost, uh, mid-century French in a certain way, like Marie to us, you know, it's got uh, these little tiny segments that sort of try to poke holes in the previous way of telling stories. Yes. So, so they're written completely differently yes. in very different ways, but this aside, because it's a, a, an, eye, an eye from the sky, yes. um, can see through both and it ties, stitches the book together. Yes, yes. And there's another, an, again, a lovely technique. Um, you do, we, we, the reader, are sli- we're just slightly wrong-footed Mm-hmm. about something just mm-hmm. the, because again it's like the camera panning back and, mm-hmm. and it's very tight and then it pans back and you see oh okay to give an example there's a they go to a I think it's a gallery opening if I remember rightly it's the scene where Lotto they meet his old teacher right. if you remember that, right, that, right. that scene and there's a brief conversation between them and so that happens he has the brief conversation with his former teacher and it's only afterwards that we discover that Matilda is standing beside him. <laughs> you know, you just haven't said. And it's just so great. It's just a great technique, just for just you just a recalibration on the part right, of the right. part of the reader. Well, the voice also um, um, exposes lies. Uh, it exposes lies yeah. in a certain way. But which that's what I mean. Shakespeare's asides yeah. did as well. They just yeah. sort of opened up the idea that the narrative wasn't what was being told to us at yeah. any given moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and also. Not, it's not just Shakespeare. I mean, Greek theatre oh, yes. is, oh, yes. is all in there as well. And yes. There's a fantastic. I mean, it's fates and furies. I mean, there's a lovely sense. You you embed the sense of fate very well. I think what I mean is, for example, um, at one point, they're quite late on in the novel. They they have an argument on the phone. Mm-hmm. Um, he's away at a, a writing retreat. Mm-hmm. If you know that mm-hmm. that scene. And there's this wonderful thing where she says she he phones and she doesn't answer the phone and he tries three times doesn't answer the phone and then she said she she had decided beforehand to pick up the phone the fourth time <laughs> but he only tries three times right. you know and again that's that sense of the randomness of life that, mm-hmm. that on those little things you know greater things happen is is wonderfully well done the way you embed that through the through the, the novel is really great thanks thanks. Um, well, so I love the figures of the fates, and I love yeah. the figures of the yeah. furies, which um, you could probably talk about better than I can. But the fates are the this trio of sisters, and they're so powerful. They're very quiet. You don't see them a lot, except um, poets sort of apostrophize them a lot. Um, but what they do is they spin the stuff of life, they measure it out, and then they cut it, right? So they have power over all mortals. They, are, they can see the span of a mortal life. The Furies are another trio of sisters, um, and they're generally pre- depicted as hags. I like to see them as sort of, you know, leather-clad S&M, like, badasses. Um, you know, they're just, they're amazing. Um, and these are Kafani goddesses. They are ancient. They are as ancient as any other gods and goddesses in the cosmos. And their job is to chase down malefactors, you know, matricides, people who, you know, um, to go against the law of the gods. Um, and I just love them, right? I mean, I love them, and I love them as almost animating philosophical figures for both parts of the book yes. because Lotto believes he had faded for whatever comes yes. to him, right? He's belie- He believes that um, he's just meant to be great. Yes. Um, Mathilde is self-directed. Yes. <laughs> she's, yes. She's, yes. She does not necessarily believe in fates, but yes. she does believe in fury. That's yeah. sure, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's right, yeah. that's right, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but can we talk about their friends? Yes. Because, I mean, there are this, it, it would be misleading to suggest that they're sort of, in, you know, it's a gilded couple who don't refer to, I mean, they have many good friends, mm-hmm. lifelong mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about the friends, but also the friend, do they relate to them as a couple? Do mm-hmm. they relate to them as mm-hmm. a married couple, mm-hmm. or do they relate to the extent to which they relate to them individually? Which partly depends on the history. I realize it does depend on the history. I think mostly they relate to them as a married couple, yeah. just because they were they. Um, Lada and Matilde met in college, and they got married shortly shortly after they met. Uh, so most of the people who know them know them only as a couple. And what I, I you know I see this in. Everyone I know who's who's married or in an intimate partnership. You know, when it, when I say marriage, I don't necessarily mean you know officially married. I mean just together. Um, I love the idea 
that we present something to our friends, which may not be the whole truth, right? Yeah. I think I, I think a lot of times, you know, we have brunch at our house and we clean up the bathroom, which hasn't been cleaned up in like three weeks if you're in my house. Um, and, you know, and every, we make everything beautiful and we have flowers in the garden that we planted furiously the night before. Uh, and it's, you know, it's this presentation of a life um, almost smoothing over the the real difficulties inside the the partnership yes. and and I love that yes. you know I think it's so it's 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 so interesting that many people do this not everybody obviously but I think that it's um it's uh, trying to find the difference between what the reality is and and the presentation is it's kind of beautiful yeah and I think to me I, I hope this isn't too sort of fanciful but I sort of see the friends a little bit as having the function of a chorus. Oh, yes, you know, absolutely. As, as, yes. In, in the yes. Greek sense, you know, yes. as a narrating, commenting, and so yes. on, as, as they yes. weave in and out of the of the marriage, as they sort of come into focus, disappear, come back, and so on. Yes, and they comment upon each individual character, too. They sort of try yes. to, to look at the characters. They're almost, in, in a certain way, the stand-ins for the reader at certain yes. moments in trying to give us ideas and information about what's happening with the, the characters. Yeah. Yes, and it's like, as we were saying earlier, it's rather like the, the Greek theatre yes. where issues were debated, the issues of the day were debated in the same space. As yes. The, as the form. So, and well, no, explain this to the audience, because the, the, oh, that just, was when we were... Uh, yeah. the, the, in a, the Greek theatre, the, in the amphitheatres themselves, that the, there were the performances, as we would think of them, but also uh, the debates and issues of the day were discussed in the same space. There's the, so the, the, the understanding of what that space was for was, was different. Um, mm -hmm. but, that was, but again, you, that's what's so lovely about your book, is that there's that sort of even-handedness in your approach to it. You're setting this out for us to, to read, it seems to me. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I've got very clear ideas. Uh-huh. But okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just just one more thing sure. and then we uh, if you'd like to ask questions ladies and gentlemen there's a I'm sure you know the form there's a mic in the center aisle here. Um, if you'd like to make your way there now um, we'll move to your questions after I just ask one more thing. Um, just coming back to partly Shakespeare but partly you were saying earlier about working on different Books at the same yes, time. Just yes. the, the question of authorship, oh, um, yes. you know, yes, and, yes, and yes. the extent to which an author is ever the sole author of their work. Could you just talk about that? Yeah, well, I believe that an author is never the sole author of uh, his or her work, right? I mean, it, 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 it's astonishing to believe that there's one name on the cover of my book. It's, it's sad, uh, actually, because not only is a book made out of other books, you know, as, as added to the, the writer's own life, and I could put, you know, by Lauren Groff and, you know, Shakespeare and Anne Carson, and, you know, like I have a list about a million pages long, but it's also... Um, authored by the the people in one's life that make it possible that the book comes into the world, right? And in in my case, it my husband doesn't write the book, but he pays the taxes. You know, he makes sure that like when my av advance runs out, I still have money to pay the babysitters. You know, he makes the book happen um, in a very real way. And that's what, when I was talking before about reading biographies of playwrights yeah. and and sort of getting really angry that these the the wives who facilitated everything were barely mentioned in the lives of the playwrights. Yeah. That, that's sort of something that I'm I'm talking about. I'm thinking about yeah. you know, over the course of this book. Also, you know, Stacey Schiff, who is a genius, um, wrote this book uh, about Vera Nabokov, and that was this seminal book in my early life. I mean, that was she. Vera Nabokov was a tough lady, but everyone says that uh, Vladimir was the genius. I don't know. I think they both were probably. Mm, yeah. 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 But what about as, also as well as that the more the obvious contribution? But I'm thinking about the, more, the subtler contribution of influences. Oh yes, if yes, that makes yes, sense. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what I meant by saying you know it could be this is a book by Lauren Groff yeah. and Shakespeare and yeah. all the Greek you know um, uh, imaginary people. But also yeah, um, and and honestly, it's also a book by the reader too. It, it, the, the the book is not whole in itself. Yeah. It's a subjective text that yeah. changes with the the background of the reader as the yeah. reader is applied to the book. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You take some questions, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. yes. Please go ahead. In your presentation, you mentioned that you work on two or three things at a time, and I wondered, since you've had 
by the sounds of it, at least two weeks where you haven't had to pay <laughs> someone $15 an hour to look after the children. <laughs> have you brought those writings here to work on or do you have time off? No, I don't take time off because um, I feel that if you do, you can lose the, the thread so quickly. Um, and I, I'm an inherently lazy person. And so if, if I do lose a thread, it's really hard to get it back. You know, I sometimes I'd rather watch The Wire, frankly. So I, I brought my, my things here. I've been working on them in the mornings. And I, it's so wonderful to have a place where someone makes the bed for you. And, you know, there are no small people jumping in at 4 in the morning, sort of going like, let's go, let's go, let's have fun. Um, so, so I've gotten a lot of work done here. Thanks, Adelaide. Um, it's really, it's, it's kind of perfect this way. Also, room service is here. I don't have to make my own food. It's so great. Uh, yeah, I, I, I tell this to people that I teach, and I teach in a low residency program, which is um, a low residency MFA program, the best thing I've ever done. Um, but I tell my students that, you know, no matter what, if you have time to take a shower, you have time to write your book. Um, if you have 10 minutes a day, and if you don't pay attention to the book 10 minutes a day, it will easily die on you. It, it can easily die on your hands. So. Yeah, I think it's really important. Thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Um, hey, all right, I'm going to squat. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, from the sounds of what the book is, I'm sorry, I haven't read it yet. But, it's okay. Um, it's a very modern um, world that you have these characters live into, and the title is still Fates and Furies. Mm. I'm just wondering... What made you want to bring the link of these classic archetypical mythological characters? And did you kind of expect the reader to see these like ancient references in a modern story? Um, I, I try to write the book so that people who um, don't have the education I have can, can find whatever they want to in it, right? So I don't, it's not necessary to the point of the book that one knows the, the references that I'm, I'm making. At least I hope so, I don't know. Um, but uh, I, really, I really wanted, first of all, I wanted a thunderous title. And titling is really, really hard. But uh, secondly, I mean, you know, over the course of the five years that it took to write this book, the layering process, I fell in love with Greek um, mythology and with Greek drama. And actually, I don't know if you have them here. Are you, I bet you you do if you have the internet. There are these massive, <laughs> and I know you have the internet. Uh, I've been using it. Um, you have these massive um, online courses, MOOCs, uh, where you can take for free college courses from Harvard, Stanford, Oxford, from these professors who are at the very, very tops of their fields. And you can read the Iliad alongside the most brilliant brains out there. Um, and that's what I did. <laughs> I don't know anything about the Greeks other than what I have learned through my reading and through uh, taking these courses. But I was so in love with this um, that I actually created. There's a there's an opera in this book um, based on sort of the myth of antiquity that I completely mess up, um, but I mess up on purpose. And I actually created this lexicon out of ancient Greek uh, for the character, so she actually speaks a language that's stripped out of ancient Greek and sort of with French and English influences in it. And I have this probably. 15-page lexicon for her. So it's it's just, basically I wanted um, the thunder, and I wanted some of the references for people who wanted to get the references. But I also loved the figures, the animating figures of the Fates and the Furies. And that was moots. And it fits the learning fit. Your you know your research fits. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's part of the world. It's actually part of it. It works on its own terms, totally. Well, that's the thing about research, um, yeah. especially if you're researching over the, point, uh, over the course of five years. You just follow whatever is gleaming in the path, yeah. and you just have to trust that that gleam means something yeah. to your book. And when I started looking into the Greeks, I had no idea what it was going to do to my book. I just yeah. thought I was writing about a marriage. And then slowly, these levels got accreted into the, you know, yeah. into the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please, sir. Yeah. Uh, I haven't read the book, but I intend to. Thank you. Um, you had a couple of throwaway comments about female rage, which yes. I'm not familiar with. Could you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Come on. <laughs> Who else is not familiar with female rage? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it's such a rich topic. Um, uh, so what had happened, and I, I'm, I apologize if you were here yesterday, but I sort of um, was talking about the the idea of, for the female rage in this book. I was sitting having wine, lots of wine, with my friends, um, as one does, and they are all where I am. You know, they're they're you know 30s and 40s. They have kids, or they don't, but they have careers. You know, they have all these extraordinary pressures on them. And I was um, just you know looking, gazing um, critically, as one does when one's a novelist. And I said, Oh my God, you guys, we are all just boiling with rage. And I knew that this was a sensitive point because I was the wounded duck and they turned and they just sort of went, no, we're not, you know, like they just pecked me. Um, so so I, I was like, this is really rich because if they're willing to get angry over the idea of female rage, I, I, there, there's something there that I can talk about. And this is a thing that's actually coming up more and more frequently. I don't know if anybody who's read the Elena Fronte books will see female rage in action over the course of you know, 2,000 pages. And if, anybody who hasn't, what are you waiting for? This, I, they're so amazing. It's you know, a modern classic. But it's also something that I think hasn't really been addressed all that much in the history of literature. Or it has been addressed from the point of view of men, and, and then the women who are full of rage end up killing themselves, which is not usually what happens, right? Or maybe, but I hope not, right? I think that you, know, you, you end up, um, some women end up internalizing things without necessarily harming themselves. Some women explode gently outwards um, over the course of their lifetimes. Um, and so I was, just, I was interested in this phenomenon in sort of bucking the idea of the literary woman who, who out of fury, um, hangs herself, like Antigone, you know, or, or jumps in front of a train, like Anna Karenina, mm, mm, yeah. or eats arsenic, like Emma Bovary, yeah. Please. Um, I'm interested in uh, the secrets in the long relationship and the absences and the what you don't write and also what they don't say and what they do say. Do you want to comment on some of that? Yeah, so so um, in the book, for those of you who haven't read it, there are many, many, many secrets that uh, some some of which don't actually end up get getting told between the husband and the wife. Uh, and I was thinking about marriage and how it's presented and how um, I've been told in my life that absolute honesty is what you need in a marriage. But I think absolute honesty can be extraordinarily corrosive um, and really a, a, an almost a bad influence on your life. I mean, there, there's a section where, um, and I'm sorry to refer to my own book like this, but um, where um, someone says, you know, lie, a, a marriage is made out of lies. And some of the omissions are really necessary because your uh, partner would crumble if they heard, heard your internal monologue about everything that you think about them. I know just throwing my own husband under the bus, his nose hairs kill me, right? But I can't say that every single time I see them or else he would have a complex and you don't want that. You love them, right? So, so I think sometimes, you know, honesty is very important, but also containing yourself and also having a source of autonomy uh, within this unity that's, that's also extraordinarily important. And the secrets um, that one holds are part of your autonomy, the mysteries that one holds in the heart. Thank you. There was, just, there was just one other thing I wanted to ask, if we've got time. Just, what does home mean to Lotta and Matilde? Home is um, each other. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, insofar as this marriage is extraordinarily flawed, and it is, um, the characters love each oh, other. Yeah. Like, they're oh, deeply, yeah. deeply, deeply. They may not know everything about. You know, Lotto doesn't know everything about Matilde for sure, and she doesn't know everything about him, yeah. but you can't. You yeah. weren't there when your um, spouse was born. You know, you weren't there when their foundational childhood experiences happened. You can only hear them as a, a narrative that the other person has framed. And in a narrative, there's always something missing, yeah. right? So just because you don't know everything about the other person doesn't mean they're not home for you. They're not yeah. the, the, the safe space in yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, the, the 
they, they see each other as the spouse. The, as the, yes. My husband, my wife. Yes. You know, this right. sort of right. The, right. They, they, they didn't exist before then. Right. In a, in a, right. In oh, a home is so fraught, though. I mean, yeah. especially for me, because I live in Florida, which is not home to me, but my house is home. You yeah. know, my husband is home, my children are home. Yeah. So, yeah yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Complicated. Maybe my next book will be about that. <laughs> yeah. um, is there anything else anybody would like to ask? If sure. Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, you wrote about sex scenes as a power dialogue. But then you mentioned once or twice of being a transfer of power. I just wonder if you could just go into that a little bit more. Um, sex as a transfer of power? Sure. Uh, sex scenes. Actually, I don't know if I can. Um, <laughs> yeah. You can step in. <laughs> <laughs> a sex scene is a transfer of power. Yes, because a dialogue is a transfer of power. A good dialogue in fiction. If you if you look at really great dialogues that that um, change something in the book, there, it's it's about a subtle undercurrent of power that's passing between one person to the other, right? And it, whatever the power is, it may be emotional. It may actually be transactional, um, but it's it's some sort of source that's that's uh, alive in the book. Now, a sex scene is only, it's the same thing, but it's just physical dialogue, right? It, it's it, what's happening between the earthy bodies within the book. Um, so um, there's a transfer of, of power in an interesting dialogue. It, that, that's, it's just, it, it's what happens. So someone um, expends what someone, his emotion uh, with the other person, Oh my, I don't want to go any further. It's going to get really blue. Um, but d does that make any sense to you? D did I explain uh, it? That's fine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note. On that note, thank you, everybody. <laughs>